In the book of Jude, verse 22 and verse 23, Jude penned these words. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. I would like to welcome you to the Perry Plains Church of Christ study for May the 29th of 2022. As we continue our study in the book of Jude. Last week, we started looking at how to keep ourselves from being misled, led astray by false teachers that are in the world. We looked at several things. We need to remember the words that were spoken before, the words of the apostles. Remember the word. We need to build ourselves up on the, our most holy faith. We've got faith. We need to add to our faith. The only way that we can add to our faith is to continue to study the word of God. Read the word of God. Thirdly, to keep ourselves from being misled by false teachers, we need to be praying in the Holy Spirit. We need to be praying according to the will of the Father. We need to pray the word, what the word states, what the will of God is for our lives. We need to stay in the love of God. The way that we stay in the love of God is to obey the word of God. If you love me, keep my commandments. As we keep the commandments of our Lord and Savior, of our Lord God, He abides in us and we abide in Him. We need to look for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to look forward to eternal life. The reason why we need to look forward to mercy is because as we obey the word, we'll fall short. None of us are perfect. And we need to continue to live as if Jesus is coming back today. Just within a short while, we do not know when he'll come back. But we ought to be looking for his, <clears throat> excuse me, his return. The problem, if there were some to whom Jude was writing that did not stay with the word as we have just emphasized. And that's what Judas emphasized is the word of God. They were beginning to listen to false teachers. And so as we look at our text, we realize that some had fallen from grace and had lost their salvation. Let's look at three different translations of these verse. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. In the New American Standard, it says, And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. And then the NRS says, and have mercy on some who were wavering. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And have mercy on still others with fear. Hating even the tunic defiled by their bodies. I'm not a Greek scholar. I, I've only had two sessions of Greek. And I've probably I've got more than what I can even remember. I don't want us to get bogged down on the <coughs> excuse me, the way that these different translations translate this particular verse. I don't want to get bogged down on whether they're referring to two or three different groups of people in verse 22 and 23. But what I see from this text is that sometimes we approach people a little different depending upon their state of departure from Christ on their stage of apostasy, on their stage of listening to false teachers. In our text, it mentions having mercy 
and compassion upon these people. As we look at Luke chapter 10, we have this Jew that's been to Jerusalem for worship and he's ret evidently returning home and he falls among thieves who beat him, rob him, leave him for dead. Two religious people walk right on by. In fact, even try to avoid him by going the other side of the road and have nothing to do with him. They just left him. And it was a Samaritan, a good Samaritan that stopped to help him. And Jesus asked a question in verse 36 and answers it in verse 37. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, he that showeth mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Yes, we are to have mercy towards others. As Jesus admonishes his disciples, he admonishes us to go and do likewise. Trip Prince made this statement. Mindfulness of our brokenness and the depths of our own forgiveness frees us to extend mercy to all, even those who do not deserve it. Yes, we extend grace and mercy and forgiveness because that is what we have received from God and that we ought to express that and show that to others in our lives. We need to be mindful of the extremes our Lord God went to for our salvation. In Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, we read these words. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. I am very grateful for the extreme that my Lord, my God went to to save me. Are we? Sometimes we don't think too much of this until we are the ones that are lost, I'm grateful. And I know if you are a child of God today, that you are very grateful also. Today, I want us to look at what Jude is sharing with us and what we need to see from the underlying message is that we need to show mercy and compassion upon those who do waver, those who waver from the truth. Who are the ones wavering? It's Christians, and that's what we need to remember. It is children of God that are wavering. Two groups are specifically mentioned in the King James Version. And as I mentioned earlier, other translation mentions three groups. False teachers have convinced some planted a seed where they have become doubters. Secondly, we're going to be looking at others who are in the fire. Thirdly, we're going to be looking at some who have their garments stained by the flesh. But it is Christians who have been sanctified by God the Father in the past, who have gone down these three paths, that are headed down these three paths. And Judah's writing about those who are being deceived by the apostates. So the first group 
that I want us to look at that James mentioned are the ones that are doubters. In Jude, verse 22, and some have compassion, making a difference. When you first read this verse, it's, it's almost as if you show compassion to other people, you're going to make a difference in their lives. Well, that is true. When we show love and mercy and forgiveness towards other people, it can make a difference in their lives. And I was doing some study and research on this particular word. I realized that there's another idea is that I am to make a distinction between those who have been led away because of weakness and those who out of pride and rebellion leave Christ. I'm to make that distinction based upon what I read in the Word of God in their, their actions. Adam Clark made this statement. The general meaning of this exhortation is supposed to be Ye are not to deal alike with all those who have been seduced by false teachers. You're to make a difference between those who have been led away by weakness and imprudence and those who, in the pride and arrogance of their hearts and their unwillingness to submit to wholesome discipline, have separated themselves from the church and become its inveterate enemies. The word difference in the original language means to separate, make a distinction, discriminate, to prefer. It means to withdraw oneself, to desert. It means to separate oneself in a hostile spirit, to oppose, strive with, dispute, contend, to be at variance with oneself. Where is all this taking place? It's taking place in the heart, in the mind of the individual that's listening to these false teachers. The seed has been planted. And when the seed is planted, Sometimes it begins to grow, doesn't it? We begin to doubt. We doubt what we have been taught from the Word of God. Now, I'm not saying that um, everything that man teaches is from the Word of God. What I'm saying is we've been, we begin to doubt what the Word of God states. Isn't that what the devil did with Eve? <laughs> yes, it is to doubt what God had said. As we look at this particular word, difference, in Jude one twenty two, it is the same word that's used for doubting in Acts 10, verse 19 and verse 20. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them that were doubting is the same Greek word for the word difference. In Romans 14, verse 23, we have the same word that is being used. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So the word really isn't mean difference in the first century as it means today, as it meant in 1611. But it's the idea is this is we have this turmoil in our minds. These people whom Jude is referring to are believers who have listened to those who have crept in and promoted their false teaching that grace gives us a license to sin. They are wavering between the sound doctrine that they'd received from the apostles and and the teachings that these false apostles, false teachers are proclaiming that have crept in. They've been taught it's okay to sin because we are under grace. So we don't worry about our sin. But if one begins to sin without any kind of reservation, when he's been taught that it is wrong to commit a sin, what happens to their conscience? It bothers them, doesn't it? I hope it does. But eventually, we continue to practice it and practice it and practice it. And eventually, our consciences become seared. But to begin with, we begin to doubt, don't we? This is where they were. And what does this lead to? Begin to doubt other teachings. The same thing that happens in the church today. The acceptance of alternative lifestyles. The acceptance of 
women preachers and leaders in the church, the, the practice and acceptance of abortion, the whether or not man-made mechanical instruments can be used in worship. And I can just keep naming things over, uh, often over, uh, many times. A little lie, a little anti-biblical doctrine is planted, and that's all that it takes. And it causes turmoil in the mind and in the heart. How many times do we think about a little song that we learned possibly when we were growing up. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. You'll oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. But do we remember the next part? Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. You'll oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. We need to be careful what we hear. We shouldn't be listening and hearing false doctrine being taught. We need to be listening to what the truth is, what the word of God states. But we'd have compassion on these people who are struggling in their minds with what is right and what is wrong. These people have inner turmoil and would extend to them compassion and mercy. And this isn't a suggestion, it's a command. It's like a pharmacy dispensing medicine to make our body healthy, we are to be God's pharmacist as to speak as an illustration to continue to dispense mercy to help restore the souls, to help restore spiritual health in the lives of others. Now let's all be honest for a minute. If someone comes to us week after week, continually expressing doubts over what they believe, our fleshly reaction is to tell them to get over it. Just get in the Word and grow up. But we are called on and commanded to dispense God-like compassion whenever the need arises. We are not to criticize and condemn these Christians struggling with their wavering faith, but we're to give them what they need. And remembering this simple definition of mercy, it is not giving them what they deserve, but what they need. God hasn't given us what we deserve. But as the result of being in Jesus Christ, he's giving us what we need. Then in verse 23, there are those in the fire. Another saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. I know with this Precious group, men and women, do not understand what they're going through. They don't understand what's on their hearts and what's on their minds. It seems as if they are participating and going along with these false teachers in this text. I do, I do know this much. I do know that if they stay on their present course, they're going to be in hellfire. I do know if they don't repent, they're going to be in hellfire when judgment day comes. For Jude says, pulling them out of the fire. But notice, pull them out with fear. We need to be careful with fire or we're the ones going to get burned also. It is spiritually dangerous to stay around apostates and others who steadfastly reject and oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there is opportunity to study with them, it should be done with the greatest of caution, snatching them out of the fire, as it were, and being careful not to get burned ourselves in the process. It ought to be done with an attitude of care, love, and mercy. It reminds me of Galatians 6, verse 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in the fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So even when we go to a brother that's in sin, living in sin, 
rejecting Christ, we need to be careful so that we don't fall into temptation ourselves. But these people need to know where they are headed if they do not repent. D.L. Moody reportedly said, I must not preach hell unless I preach it with tears. And that's so true. We need, in our compassion, show it to others. We're not sharing hellfire with others and enjoy sharing hellfire with others, that that's where they're going. But it ought to cause us to have tears in our hearts for these individuals. Larry Moyer made the following statement. Do you want to know where abortionists go? Do you want to know where rapists go? Do you want to know where God sends homosexuals? What I hear, when I hear that, I often want to stop, step up and say, and do you want to know where Larry Moyer deserves to go? I'm not an abortionist, rapist, or homosexual, but I have unkind thoughts and selfish attitudes. One could question whether or not, whether or not there must be actual tears, but one would find it hard to disagree with the point that D.L. Moody was making. Hell is a horrible place. And remorse must be felt for anyone going there, headed there. A preacher was asked why he didn't preach hellfire. Soon afterward, the preacher tried it and the message fell flat. A kind listener advised him that if he wanted to preach about hell, he should preach in love, not hatred. He cautioned the preacher not to preach about hell as if that's where he wanted his listeners to go but rather as if it were a place he wanted to save them from. Do people see compassion in us when we go to them to help to restore them? In Matthew 18, what is our goal in going? It's not for disfellowship. It's for restoration. It's to gain a brother back. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Now, what was the goal? To gain the brother back. In James chapter 5, verse 19 and verse 20, Brethren, if any man, if any of you, if any woman, do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. The purpose in going to a fallen way, brother, is to convert him. Have these people fallen from grace at this particular time? I don't know. I do know if they stay on their present course, they will end up in hell fire. Some of them are so close to the fire, they need to be snatched away. And others need to be snatched out of the fire. They were to have the attitude of a parent who sees their child in the path of an oncoming car and runs to snatch and rescue them from harm's way. We are firemen who rescues people from fires. Who are firemen in the church? It's Christians. A.T. Robertson made this statement. A fireman is to physically rescue a temporal life, whereas believers are spiritually rescue an eternal soul. What's the upshot? The church of Jesus Christ should be packed full with spiritual firemen and firewomen. The firemen in the firehouse are always on duty, on high alert to receive victims. Let me ask you, dear reader, and I ask this of myself as I write, are you always on duty, ready, able, and willing to throw the rescue line out to those in danger 
of perishing eternally. What's the purpose of being at a fire if you're not going to do anything? What's the purpose of going to one of our members who is starting to follow a false teacher? Salvation. Pulling them out of the fire. In Zechariah chapter 3, I'm reminded he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. And I said, Let them see a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by and notice. Come out of fire. New change of garments. 1 Corinthians 5. A man is living in adultery with his father's wife. Now, I want you to notice verse 5. The purpose, the reason why they practiced church discipline, the reason why they disfellowshipped this man, but he wouldn't repent. But notice verse 5. To deliver such a one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved, so the man might repent. And we get over to the book of Second Corinthians, and the man does repent. In fact, Paul tells them in Second Corinthians chapter two, he says, "I want you to confirm your love towards this man who had been living in sin and has repented." And God has forgiven him. You need to do the same. You reconfirm your love for this man. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Or as Jude says, snatching them out of the fire. Listen to the third verse. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feeling life buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, awakened by kindness, cords that are broken will vibrate once more. Did you hear the phrase, touched by a loving heart? Weakened by kindness, wakened by kindness. That's the mercy that Jude is calling us to live out before those that are perishing. Speaking kind words, not harsh, not condemning, will open the door for the gospel than the other way. So let's pray for boldness. Let's pray that we will be bold enough to exhibit mercy and kindness to these people and at the same time proclaim truth unto them. To speak boldly the good news of Jesus. To rescue the perishing. Snatching them from eternal separation from God. A third group that's possibly mentioned here are those who have been stained. Their garments have been stained by the flesh. The American, uh, New American Standard says, And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. The word hate means to pursue with hatred, detest, to be hated, detested, to love less. It means to love, means to dislike str strongly, to have a strong aversion to or to detest. And the word garment was the a tunic, an undergarment usually worn next to the skin, a garment, a vestment. It's the inner of the two articles of clothing in everyday use. And since it was worn close to the skin, it's quite likely to be stained by the body, as a t-shirt is today. And as we look back in the Old Testament, we find that the wearing 
of a leper, the clothing of a leper, was considered contaminated and had to be burned. These individuals had become so corrupt that in a sense their undergarments were defiled. In Matthew 10, verse 16, as we go out to these individuals, we need to listen to the admonition of Jesus to his own. He says, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In 2 Peter 3, 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye might be found of him in peace without spot and blameless as we go out to these individuals. Look at verse 17 and 18. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory now and forever. Beware, lest we also are led away in the air. We are to become involved in the lives of those who stray away from God, who stray away from the family of God, who stray away from us. What kind of job are we doing? It's one thing to sing, rescue the perishing. It's another thing to rescue some of them, snatching them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Are we then just to let them lead, live their lives the way they want to? Not without trying to snatch them out of the fire. Not without trying to share with them what the Word of God states with compassion. Are we to be tolerant with their beliefs? No, not when they are contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only one gospel and we can't add to it. We can't take it away. It is the gospel of God that saves us. That's the power. The power of God. There are going to be doubters at times. There are going to be those that are in the fire. There are going to be those who have their garments stained by the flesh, by sin in their lives. Let's have compassion towards these. Let's try to make a difference in their lives. Showing them the love of God, the patience of God, the forgiveness of God when they repent. But help them to realize the path they're on will not lead them to heaven itself, to the presence of God. Without a change that the gospel is able to do. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for allowing me to bring this message into your home. Let's continue to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ.